Hi, I'm Lindsay, and I'm talking with medtech industry leaders on how they change lives for a better world. The inventions and technologies are fascinating, and so are the people who work with them. There was a period of time where I realized fundamentally my job was to go hang out with really smart people that are saving lives and then do work that would help them save more lives. I got into the business to save lives, and it is incredibly motivating to work with people who are in that same business, saving or improving lives. What better industry than where I get to wake up every day and just save people's lives? These are extraordinary people doing extraordinary work, and this is The Leading Difference. Hello, and welcome to The Leading Difference podcast. I'm your host, Lindsay, and I'm so excited to be speaking with my guest today. Dasha Tishlik. Growing up, Dasha knew she wanted to become an entrepreneur, leading people to change the world through innovative products and services. Her love for technology and problem solving led her to study engineering science, focusing on biomedical engineering and product development at the University of Virginia. Today, Dasha is the founder, president, and chief strategic advisor of Stratcraft and is a strategic partner for growing life science and healthcare technology companies. Dasha has developed the strategy for advanced manufacturing spinouts such as Core Composites and MicroAnt GPS. She has led company-wide strategy development and unique growth initiatives across multiple high-tech industries, including biomedical device, pharmaceutical, translational research, automotive, financial, satellite, and defense. Dasha is the director and host of Biomedical Frontiers, Stories with Innovators in Healthcare, a life sciences and biotechnology commercialization podcast hosted by the Wallace H. Coulter Translational Research Foundation at University of Virginia, and she is a lecturer at University of Virginia's Biomedical Engineering Department. Due to her deep technical understanding and ability to forge complex multi-company partnerships and agreements, she is a sought-after advisor to innovative companies working to commercialize their new technologies. All right, Dasha, thank you so much for being here. Lindsay, it's such a pleasure. Awesome. Well, I was wondering if you would be willing to start off by just telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in the medical device field and what led you to what you're doing today. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, one of the things that's been a defining uh, trajectory in my life is, is entrepreneurial pursuit. And I actually started out, I think you and I connected on this earlier, as a dance teacher um, early on in my life and I decided even in, uh, in high school since I was learning dance to, to try coming up with my own dance aerobics programs and try to pitch that to local gold gyms. And so that, that's been something I've, I've endorsed and participated in and tested out various forms of entrepreneurship over my life. But I'm also an engineer and I love interesting new technologies and the scientific approach to problem solving, kind of methodical, process-driven, uh, deeply curious ways of creating solutions. And so when I started my engineering degree, I met some people who were entrepreneurial engineers. And that really excited me that you could be a technologist who is working on solving a problem and you're not doing it just to then maybe write a paper and hope somebody notices, but then you do the steps necessary, bring the team together, find the customer, and, and then do that transition, that bridging. And so that really put me on a path, even um, when I was studying, to start exploring that. And I got to participate with an organization called VentureWell, which is really famous for supporting STEM entrepreneurship, even at undergraduate level. And at my university, I worked um, to create an organization that would help sprout kind of entrepreneurial innovation roots into the student community. So we created a Maker space. We hosted a medical hackathon, took people to startup trips to visit companies that were doing new technology developments, and, and also did some expos and speakers and things like that to expose students. And that had some really great success. A lot of people got very involved. A lot of the people that went through that with me are now entrepreneurs themselves, not all medical device entrepreneurs, although most of them were biomedical engineers but all of them very entrepreneurial and working on some really interesting technologies now. So I think that's that's kind of the defining uh, piece of, of where my career began. And then 
Today, I'm uh, consulting and helping companies, uh, particularly companies with large portfolios of new technologies um, who are trying to come up with ways to commercialize product, um, come up with that strategy for commercialization, taking one product, one technology at a time. Wow, that is an amazing backstory. Thank you for sharing all of that with me. And it is so cool to see how, first of all, the synergy, the fact that you did have a dance background as well, and you were so entrepreneurial even back then in creating this program. So I do have to ask, did that program ever get sold to a gym or to anyone? Have you developed it? Did you fully do that? Yeah, I actually had two gold gyms that I taught on a regular basis, two different types of programs. And then since I was already a teacher with Gold's Gym, they wanted to introduce some other dance programs from kind of well-known brands. So they picked me as their flagship dance instructor. So I actually ended up picking up some new classes and certifications through that. I also had a private class, just my dentist and her friends wanted to do dance, but they didn't want to enroll in a gym. So I was like, here, I'll come over, you know. Everybody pitch in, here's the price, and I'll just bring the gear and everybody dances at, at someone's living room. So we even had, and they were all really busy women, so I think it worked well for them to just, you know, be in the neighborhood and I use a living room rather than have to kind of travel. So, you know, and, and we did we did some, there was two goals gyms, but there was also, I was a substitute teacher and actually partnered with another dance trainer who was testing out ballroom dancing for people with disabilities. And so I was his like dance partner demo. So I just got to explore so many different opportunities through that and kind of see how you do business development and relationship management and new product rollouts and have to get, you know, prove that my class will bring in new customers. So it was very fun. Oh, that is incredible. I absolutely love that. Oh, my goodness. So, so you have always had this entrepreneurial bent, but then of course, like you said, you've also, you're so curious, you like exploring, you like learning new things, and you're clearly not afraid to go out and pitch those ideas to whoever will listen. So I'm, I'm curious, how did you come to the pathway of, I want to be an engineer, I want to go to school for this and develop that skill set as well? Because it's not that they're not compatible. They obviously are. But a lot of times people don't necessarily put the two together. So I'm curious how that worked for you. Yeah, when when I was so deciding to be an engineer was a little bit tough. I, I really like chemistry and I thought maybe to go into the chemistry side of things. But a lot of the people in my family are engineers. My grandmother is an engineer. Both my parents have kind of a practical math backgrounds. So there was a lot of engineering in the background of my family, and it seemed to me that the engineering focused a little bit more on kind of what's here and now, what you can build now. Science may be focused more on fundamental discovery. And so that that seemed to be kind of the difference for me is, is I thought I'm probably like a little bit more like practical here and now rather than thinking in these like 20-year timelines. And so I think it was just a better personality fit. And then once I got into engineering school, that turned out to be really a great fit because I loved learning about the technology. I loved working with other engineers who were very building, creating, designing oriented. And the way that you look at problems and investigate in engineering is very similar to scientific approach, but also tends to be then you have to then think through, OK, great, we found out how this spring works or something like that. But how do you use this spring to do something now in the world. And so I, I love that translation from kind of we have a technology, we have a, an approach to it has to work for people in the world in reality. It's so interesting because I love talking to people who are multi-passionate and have a lot of different avenues that they have pursued over the years because I do think overall the more generalist you can be, not that you shouldn't really hone in on some specifics, but the more that you can have a lot of general experience and knowledge and skill sets, it seems to all end up working really well together in the end. And it helps you be a little more creative maybe when you're solving problems or approaching a new idea or a difficult conundrum. And you're going, okay, well, you know, what's interesting is I have this background in science and engineering, and I have this background in dance and entrepreneurship and then blending it all together. I, I just love the stories of how it comes together. 
One of the things I learned when I was in engineering school is for a lot of the projects, so I took some project types of courses, and um, the first one I did that was like a year-long course, what I learned is first semester, there was somebody to train me how to do the thing, but then everybody left the class, and I was the only one left. And so the second semester on the project, I was basically spearheading like this kind of modeling uh, project, and I I had only been doing it for a few months. And I noticed right in that project that I was able to keep a team really organized, really clearly articulate goals. And at the end of the project, aside from the technical work that I was doing on it, I was actually the person synthesizing the results and communicating. And it led me to think, is there something there that's a real strength for me? And should I be doubling down on that? And that, that's an area I've pursued a lot in my career is technology communication Clearly articulating what we're trying to achieve at the onset, developing requirements, understanding the use case, et cetera. And then on the backside of it, once we've developed something, there's an entire kind of art and science to talking about technology because there's a lot of detail. A lot of the people who work in the detail of the technology want to share that science and process. But a lot of the people who then make decisions want to hear other information about the technology that might not relate to how it works or how it was built. And so by by actually having some of those experiences in engineering school, I was able to see that this technology communication and crafting of project goals was something that was really needed for engineering teams. And it really benefited when there was an engineer who was doing that, but you had to be in a different mindset and develop a different set of skills in addition to the design work. Yeah, absolutely. Now, when you, and thank you for sharing that. I love that, that bringing it all together and again, how things work together to help you. And I'm curious, so you are, you were so well prepared from an outside perspective, at least to go out on your own and become this high level, amazing consultant for these companies. Did you also feel ready? Or was it still this sort of leap of faith when you said, okay, I'm going to go in full time for myself? No, I was, I was very ready. I think like any entrepreneur, I'm going through a process of discovery by learning exactly what it is my customer really needs help with, what industries and specific technologies I'm able to bring my skills to the best, and also what types of companies are looking for help I provide. So I can't say that I knew all of that information when I started out, but I had a good experience in in the role I left when when I started my business, having had uh, walked into an engineering company that had great innovative products, but was sort of underperforming uh, in the market relative to their potential and the quality of the technology they provided and going through the process systematically of creating a company strategy with them helping them understand um, what pieces were missing from their business development side and working through the marketing and the business side of things to help them better articulate their technologies, but also taking a look at the portfolio of technologies and recognizing that some of the technologies there didn't quite fit their main business model, but were really valuable, helping them figure out a path to get those out to market separate of their company, but in a way that still contributed to the overall value of the business. And after I did that, I I had several years of success and meaningful impact to look back on. And I said, I've done it. I've proven it in one place. But in my experience doing this, I just kept meeting more and more companies that struggled with a similar kind of problem. They had all the innovation. They had an amazing, talented engineering team, but they either lacked focus on which products had the most potential, or they would develop a lot of stuff that they didn't know how to move forward into the market. And so I could see the problem all around me. I was solving it. And so after I've done enough at one company, I said, okay, I see the need and I know that I have the skills to solve it. Now I just need to kind of open that up and create a firm around this concept that helps other companies succeed in the same way. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. And so since starting your own consultancy, what has been maybe one of the most impactful or 
things that really stand out to you as one of the most exciting things that you've gotten a chance to work on? What kind of goes, oh, this is why I'm doing it this way in this industry? Yeah, so just generally, I get to meet so many interesting innovators who are changing, particularly healthcare. There are yeah. very interesting transformative technologies coming to the market that utilize virtual reality, that utilize AI technologies to do things we weren't previously able to do in medicine, to that make me visualize your body in a way that no amount of human brain power could have done uh, because of the way these models can work with data. But the the project or the specific thing that I think uh, I am most excited about in terms of its general impact is it's called Biomedical Frontier Stories with Innovators in Healthcare. And it's a podcast I'm producing on behalf of University of Virginia's Coulter Center for Translational Research. It's a center that focuses specifically on biomedical research that has potential for commercialization or you could say translation into the clinic. And they fund that research. They help with the business development efforts to bring that research into the world. And the podcast supports that mission by both highlighting the technologies that are a part of that portfolio as well as that are connected to that portfolio, but also by educating people not only on the process of invention and the process of innovation in the medical um, and life sciences industry, but I think very importantly about what is coming, the hope and the good news about some of the incredible things that are coming to the market and to the world to help solve some of our intractable problems. So I think in terms of human impact, that's probably the something that I'm working on with, with a tremendous vision that is available to all to participate in, to listen, or to be interviewed on. Excellent. Excellent. And can you just share a little bit, too, about your experience becoming a podcast host? Because you have kind of an interesting, unique story with that. And then how can people listen to this podcast? Where is it available? Yes, of course. So public speaking and presenting technology is something that I've been interested in for a long time. And even before I started my business in the director of marketing kind of roles that I've done, I've realized that video and audio communication, kind of deep diving in technology, helping create content that educates people because in a lot of engineering, even deep engineering technology areas, you're working with other engineers who are deep in some technology area that you don't necessarily understand. There's a lot of miscommunication that happens because of that. And podcasts are just a, such a powerful way to bring more education and deep conversations um, about various topics, including very niche topics, into the world. So I've kind of experimented with interviewing video interviews for some time now. But when I started my business, I was working alongside another business, Sales Chasers, and the founder of that business, Michelle Page, she and I were just kind of throwing around ideas. How do you grow your business? How do you find customers? What things we were interested in? We started kind of collaborating because, you know, you, when you're starting a business, it's just you and headphones and your computer. And, it, you know, you kind of miss, especially if you're in a, a business development communicator role, you're like, ah, I need people. <laughs> I, I need some, some sort of co-working to go on because it's, yes. it's too lonely. So she and I were each other's co-workers in that way, kind of similar stages in our, in our different consulting firms. So she and I decided to do a project called Go, Go, Grow, focusing on business to business scaling with each of us coming up with some lesson plans on kind of key frameworks, tools or ideas that are really important to business to business type of business growth. And so she and I developed that Go, Go, Grow together and put out a season uh, focusing on kind of the fundamentals that we think are the most important with some interviews of experts as well as some content that she and I kind of lesson planned together. And she's continuing on with that um, into other kinds of topics. But I was already working on this podcast and I was teaching at University of Virginia um, a class in the biomedical engineering department focused on engineers' professional development skills and so when I was talking to my co-lecturer, who is the professor at the university and the head of the Coulter Translational Research Center, 
he had this idea, oh, we should do a podcast. And I said, let me help you. Can I please do this? So I created a vision for what we could do, tying his uh, foundation's uh, mission and the goals that we were both pursuing in the class in terms of professional development for biomedical engineers, and then presented it to the engineering department, uh, to the biomedical engineering uh, department. And uh, that's how we got started. Oh, amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that. And yes, please go check out her podcast. It's going to be just really informative. You'll learn a lot and you'll also get a lot of inspiration. Like she said about the fact that there's so many new amazing technologies emerging. There's a lot of reason for hope and optimism. And that's a good reminder, especially nowadays. So absolutely. Well, I'm curious, are there any moments or any one moment that stands out to you as just this realization that you chose the right industry, you chose med tech for a reason, that it just kind of clicked into place. Yes, this is why I'm here. Hmm. I think I think there's been a couple small moments, but each meaningful. I think yeah. when I got my first client that was really outside of my existing network. It was uh, somebody I met through the work I was doing of developing my business and not somebody who I'd previously known or worked with or anything like that. I think that was a real key moment. That That's like a line that you cross. You're like, okay, this is not about my network or the people who sort of know me. My value and the skills are clear. I can clearly articulate them to somebody else and somebody else can put the trust in me to help them deliver something. Yeah. So I think that was one is that first uh, client that's sort of outside of, of anybody you knew at the moment you started your business. I think the second one was uh, really landing my first kind of big client, a company that really does a lot of technologies and they're not necessarily like a startup. They're mature. They have um, a lot of technology. They have a lot of process. That was That was something that I was like, okay, now I know that I, I'm starting to get into the kinds of companies that I'm envisioning helping, and they are seeing the value that I can provide them back. So we're in agreement, and it's starting to make sense. And I think the third moment was when so I have an analyst on my team. I also have some different suppliers and people, other consultants that I work with, so kind of distributed network, plus starting to build my internal team. And the first time a client approached me to actually hire uh, somebody, my junior consultant from my team on a project based on something that this person did for a project that I was primarily working on. And so really starting to see that some of the processes and systems and ideas I'm putting in place, that it's no longer just because of me, but now it's starting to say it's because of the company and, and there's skills that other people on my team have that, you know, knowing that I manage them and knowing their skills, they, they want to hire them and me because of them. Now I know that I'm moving beyond sort of solopreneurship and into there's a company here and we're developing a shared capability. So that mm. sort of reinforces the vision and opens up a lot of possibilities. Yeah, that is incredible. First of all, you know, congratulations, because it's hard enough when you venture out on your own, but then to go ahead and have so much success. And I'm sure, you know, you have that daily grind, so it's not always all sunshine and rainbows, but to be able to grow your team and to have that moment of, oh my goodness, this is a company. It's not just me now, it's a company and there's other team members and we're all providing such value to our clients. That is amazing. Congratulations. That is just the first step. So I'm really excited for you. Thank you. Yes, me too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, pivoting the conversation just for fun. Imagine you were to be offered a million dollars to teach a master class on anything that you want. It can be in your industry. It doesn't have to be. What would you choose to teach and why? Oh, that's a tough one. I actually have a competing hobby uh, that I would probably choose from. And that is how to set up a wonderful backyard garden that produces food and flowers for the season. Oh, okay. I think we I think we need more backyard gardens and uh, more gardeners. But I think I would have to spend that entire million dollars on getting people to attend. So maybe not the best choice of a million dollars. But 
professionally speaking, I think I would love to teach about setting up frameworks for thinking about any kind of problem, really, but business development-related problems. I think there's, there's a lot of really great frameworks out there. I'm teaching people how to use them in order to anchor your thinking and your decision-making in kind of a shared understanding of priorities that requires a framework. So we could start with the frameworks that exist, but teaching people how to think outside the box and create their own framework for the situation, how to be basically their own strategy consultant uh, in PowerPoint or on paper and help them think through problems that are complex and chaotic by creating frameworks would be, I think, really valuable to many people. I don't think it's taught very often. And certainly it's, it's such a huge leg up on any kind of problem solving that you have to do to be able to kind of anchor yourself in a structure before you go and, and start making decisions. Yeah, I love that. I love that idea too, because especially something that you said really struck a chord with me about solving the idea of chaotic and overwhelming problems and creating a framework for that. Because, you know, there's so, so much of life is, I mean, life is a learning curve, right? So there's so many times where it might be very helpful to approach even a personal problem or a personal challenge that comes up with the idea of a framework where you can say, okay, yes, this feels overwhelming and anxiety inducing and whatever other big feelings you have about it that make it feel so overwhelming you can't even get started. But what if you think about it in terms of a framework and how could that help you take it out of all of the emotion maybe and help you transform it into, okay, this can be resolved as some creative problem solving strategy. I think that'd be amazing. Yeah, and sometimes when you put things in a framework, you discover that neither, either pieces of information that you need to actually make a decision or, or a path forward are just missing. You put it in a framework, you're like, oh, of course, it makes sense. I'm missing this whole thing of information. Or alternatively, some, so it can actually stimulate that aspect of creative thinking, but also it can prompt more idea generation. And, and I do find sometimes it's like the problem diagnosis Sometimes if I come into a scenario where there's a lot of confusion about what do we do, how do we move forward, what product should we choose, what business model should we choose, the, ch the first thing to do is to create a framework for decision making because you go and you do the research and get the information, you still don't know which one to do because the information by itself you know, unless the information is like there's zero opportunity here, but there's never information like that. The information is always like there's some pros over here and some pros over here and some cons and some cons. So without the framework, you just drown in the amount of knowledge. Facts without a framework don't lead to a decision. They just lead to a lot of facts. So learning how to step back, when do you actually go back to a framework and how do you create a framework for this situation? Because sometimes it feels like you don't have a framework for this situation. The situation's unique. But you can then come up with your own framework, merging ideas from other frameworks or utilizing your own creative skills to kind of draw up a structure within which you can make decisions. So I think that would be that would be a very fun master class. It would be fun and super valuable. So I'll sign up for that when you give that. Well, how do you wish to be remembered after you leave this world? I, I always focus on three areas of growth for myself. When people ask me what I want to be, I think kinder, wiser, and more courageous is what I want to be over time. And so I would hope that I don't know that those things have a definite end, but if I can be remembered as having worked towards that in a way that people felt in their lives, then that will be good. Yeah, that's a beautiful answer. And finally... What is one thing that makes you smile every time you see or think about it? Flowers. I love, especially on the side of the road when you're driving somewhere, and sometimes you see that nowadays on highways, there's been some wildflower planting. That's just so good. It's good for the environment. It's beautiful on the eyes. It's good for the bees. So, so always happy to see more flowers being planted for a more beautiful world. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. Great answer. 
Well, thank you so very much for joining me today, Dasha. This has been such a pleasure and I'm just so impressed with you and everything that you're bringing to the world to help these amazing companies become even more effective and this creative problem solving that you bring to it with your frameworks and whatnot. So I just want to say, you know, a huge kudos to you for everything that you're doing. The podcast, I hope that all of my listeners go and check hers out as well. And yeah, just thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Of course. And we are so honored to be making a donation on your behalf as a thank you for your time today to the Polaris Project, which is a non-governmental organization that works to combat and prevent sex and labor trafficking in North America. So thank you for choosing that organization to support. And we wish you continued success as you work to change lives for a better world. Thank you very much. And thank you for that donation on my behalf. Oh, yeah. And thank you so much to our listeners for tuning in. And if you're feeling as inspired as I am right now, I'd love if you'd share this episode with a colleague or two. And we will catch you next time. The Leading Difference is brought to you by Valentium. Valentium is a full-service CDMO with 100% in-house capability to design, develop, and manufacture medical devices from Class II wearables to Class III active implantable medical devices. Valentium specializes in active implantable, leads, programmers, and accessories across a wide range of indications such as neuromodulation, deep brain stimulation, cardiac management, and diabetes management. Valentium's core competencies include electrical, firmware, and mechanical design, mobile apps, embedded cybersecurity, human factors and usability, automated test systems, systems engineering, and contract manufacturing. Valentium works with clients worldwide, from startups seeking funding to established Fortune 100 companies. Visit valentium.com to explore your next step in medical device development.